1791, the French Revolution in Europe also inspires a revolution in the French Caribbean colony of Haiti. The aftereffect of the 13-year conflict will ruin Haiti, which remains an unhappy land to this day. The revolution begins as a slave uprising, but eventually degenerates into a genocidal race war targeting French settlers in Haiti, including many who had opposed slavery and were friendly toward the blacks. Even after slavery had been abolished, radical elements of the Haitian Revolution continued to incite racial hatred toward the innocent whites, who were far outnumbered by the blacks and mulattoes. In 1802, a notorious killer named Jean-Jacques Dessalines takes over Haiti by betraying his more reasonable and actually pro-French black predecessor Toussaint Louverture. Napoleon had previously sent troops to retake Haiti, but as many as 40,000 died of yellow fever. Now preoccupied with European wars, there is little he can do to save the whites of Haiti. The smart whites get out, but many of the bleeding heart liberal types refuse to see the danger of being such a small minority under black Jacobin rule. In 1804, Dessalines orders the genocidal massacre of the remaining white population of Haiti. His secretary, Boisrong Tonnerre, declares, quote, For our declaration of independence, we should have the skin of a white man for parchment, his skull for an inkwell, his blood for ink, and a bayonet for a pen." End quote. Squads of black soldiers move from house to house, killing entire families. The weapons used are silent ones, such as knives and bayonets rather than gunfire. This is so that the killing can be done more quietly, thus giving no loud gunfire warning to other intended victims. Killings take place on the streets. Plundering and rape also occur. White children are beaten and stabbed to death, and white women are raped and pushed into forced marriages under threat of death. To flush out whites who went into hiding, the monster Dessalines proclaims an amnesty for all whites. When the terrified whites resurface, they too are murdered. One of the most diabolical of the massacre participants is Jean Zombie, a mulatto known for his brutality. One account describes how Zombie stops a white man on the street, strips him naked, and takes him to the stairs of the presidential palace where he kills him with a dagger as Dessalines watches. In the Haitian voodoo cult tradition, the figure of Jean Zombie is the prototype for the zombie. The massacre results in the deaths of between 4,000 to 5,000 people of all ages and genders. But because the victims were white and the perpetrators were black Jacobins, the historians who serve the New World Order have forgotten them. Napoleon, by a very wide margin, is elected Emperor of the French in a November 1804 plebiscite. He is crowned by Pope Pius VII as Napoleon I at Notre Dame Cathedral. The story that Napoleon seized the crown out of the hands of the Pope during the ceremony to avoid subjugating to the Pope's authority is not accurate as the coronation procedure had been agreed upon in advance. After a string of stunning victories, France establishes itself as the leading continental power of Europe and builds alliances of its own. Napoleon is now larger than life, a development which has the British, Bourbon, and New World Order types all seething. 1804 Emperor of the French is the title used by Napoleon Bonaparte. The title demonstrates that Napoleon's coronation is not a restoration of old world monarchy, but rather an introduction of a new political system, the Empire of the French. The title emphasizes that fact that the emperor rules over the French people and not over France, the Republic. The Constitution, Napoleonic Code, will be the supreme law of the realm, not the whims of Napoleon or any successor. The Old World formula, King of France, indicated that the Bourbon king owned France as a personal possession. The new title is purposefully created to reinforce the ideal of the French Republic and to show that after the French Revolution, the feudal system has been abandoned once and for all. A nation-state with equal rights and opportunities for all citizens is the new way of doing things. Napoleon is considered the first monarch proclaiming himself as an embodiment of the nation rather than as a divinely appointed ruler. A constitutional monarchy, limited monarchy, or parliamentary monarchy, in its most limited form a crowned republic, is a form of government in which governing powers of the monarch are restricted or clearly defined. Although seen as a son of the revolution, Napoleon believes that reason and not the desires of the easily manipulated masses is the best and natural course to follow. 
In this sense, Napoleon is an enlightened despot, the best possible system of government, he believes. In order to rule all the more wisely and rationally, Napoleon surrounds himself with intelligent and skilled advisers, mathematicians, scientists, and statesmen. For Napoleon, enlightened despotism is more than just an ideal. The man is indeed a true intellectual powerhouse, a fact that even his detractors, past and present, readily admit. Unlike many European rulers of the day, the quick-witted Napoleon is unusually wise, shrewd, and rational. Upon visiting him, leading intellectuals from around Europe are all impressed with the quality of his mind and speech. There can be no doubt, Napoleon Bonaparte has the stuff of legend flowing through his veins. On the first anniversary of his coronation, Napoleon defeats Austria and Russia at the Battle of Austerlitz. The subsequent peace of Pressburg leads to the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire and creation of the Confederation of the Rhine, with Napoleon named as its protector. Napoleon later states, The Battle of Austerlitz is the finest of all I have fought. This breaks up the third coalition by knocking Austria out, but Britain and Russia remain in a state of war with France. To commemorate the victory, Napoleon commissions the Arc de Triomphe, 1805-1808. After a long string of stunning victories, France establishes itself as the leading continental power of Europe as it builds new alliances of its own. In 1806, Napoleon appoints his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, King of Naples. He also appoints other members of his family to rule over conquered Bourbon family kingdoms, such as Naples and Spain. In May of 1806, the Kingdom of Holland is established with another brother, Louis Bonaparte, named as King. With each new war imposed upon France by the British Bourbon Rothschild axis of common interest, new territories across Europe, formerly hostile towards France, fall under the benevolent sovereignty of Napoleon. The conquests of Napoleon must be viewed through this prism. The prideful British imperialists, the old line crown heads of Europe, especially the Bourbons, and the influential Rothschild financiers will never accept this situation. It is they, not Napoleon, who wish to continue the Napoleonic Wars until Napoleon is destroyed. Prussia replaces Austria in a new coalition with Russia and, as always, Great Britain. In June 1807, the Prussians and Russians are soundly defeated at the Battle of Friedland, major confrontation between the armies commanded by Napoleon and the armies of the Russian Empire led by Count von Benigsen. The battlefield is located in modern-day Kaliningrad Oblast, near the town of Pravdinsk. The Russian army retreated chaotically over the Ali River by the end of the fighting, effectively ending the Fourth Coalition. July 1806 Napoleon establishes the Confederation of the Rhine, effectively ending the Holy Roman Empire which was established by Charlemagne in 800. The Confederation of the Rhine, officially called the Confederated States of the Rhine, is a confederation of 16 German client states placed under French rule by Napoleon after he defeated Austria and Russia in the Battle of Austerlitz. The Treaty of Pressburg, in effect, led to the creation of the Confederation. The members of the Confederation were German princes from the Holy Roman Empire. They were later joined by 19 others, all together ruling a total of over 15 million subjects, providing a significant strategic advantage to France on its eastern front. Obviously, the larger German states of Prussia and Austria were not members. With the relentless allies waging constant wars against France, Napoleon needed the soldiers and supplies that the new Confederation could provide him with. France inducted 63,000 Confederation troops to its army. Joseph Bonaparte, 1768 to 1844, is the elder brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, who made him King of Naples and Sicily, and later King of Spain. As a lawyer and diplomat, Joseph served as the ambassador to Rome. In September 1800, as Minister Plenipotentiary, he signed a treaty of friendship and commerce between France and the United States. In 1795, Joseph was a member of the Council of Ancients, where he used his position to help his brother overthrow the Directory four years later. In 1806, Joseph was given military command of Naples, previously ruled by the same Bourbon family that ruled France. 
and shortly afterward was made king by Napoleon, to be replaced two years later by his sister's husband, Joachim Murat. Joseph was then made king of Spain, a state that was also previously part of the Bourbon dynasty, in August 1808, soon after the French invasion. As king of Naples, Joseph is very popular, but when he arrives in Spain, the Frenchman is not so popular, though he also had a base of support. Joseph, known as Jose I, comes under heavy fire from his opponents in Spain, who try to smear his reputation by calling him Pepe Botella, meaning Joe Bottle, for his alleged heavy drinking. In reality, Joseph is not a heavy drinker. Joseph's arrival sparks the Peninsular War, a reactionary revolt against new institutions and ideas, instigated by the previous Bourbon monarchs, and most likely aided and abetted by the British. As the war turns badly for the Bonapartes, Joseph temporarily retreats with much of the French army to northern Spain. Joseph then proposes his own abdication from the Spanish throne. Napoleon dismisses Joseph's misgivings and sends French reinforcements to assist Joseph in maintaining his position as king of Spain. Despite the easy recapture of Madrid and nominal control over many cities and provinces, Joseph's reign over Spain is tenuous and constantly resisted by pro-Bourbon royal family guerrillas. That is where the term guerrillas originates from. After the end of the wars, Joseph escapes to the United States, where he lives between 1817 and 1832, initially in New York City and Philadelphia. He later moves to an estate called Point Breeze in Bordentown, New Jersey. At Point Breeze, Joseph entertains many of the leading intellectuals and politicians of his day. Amongst American society, the Napoleons, who, like the Americans, had also fought against King George III and his ruling circle, and are viewed positively. Joseph Bonaparte returns to Europe, where he dies in 1844, in Florence, Italy. Louis Bonaparte, 1778 to 1846, had also been involved in the plot to overthrow the Directory. In 1806, Napoleon makes Louis the King of Holland. The benevolent new king quickly learns the Dutch language, takes the Dutch version of his name, Lodewijk, and declares himself Dutch, not French. Having declared himself Dutch, Lodewijk requires French ministers and members of his court to speak only Dutch and to renounce their French citizenships. After his abdication and loss of his kingdom in 1810, Louis is granted asylum by Emperor Francis I of Austria. He takes refuge there and turns to writing and poetry. After the death of his eldest brother Joseph in 1844, Louis is seen as the Bonapartists, as the rightful emperor of the French, although Louis takes little action to advance this claim. November 1806 once again, in response to the naval blockade of French coasts imposed by the vaunted British Navy in May 1806, Napoleon issues the Berlin Decree. This brings into effect a large-scale embargo against British trade, known as the Continental System, also known as the Continental Blockade. The plan is intended to stop all shipping of British goods into continental European countries allied with or dependent upon France. In terms of economic damage to Great Britain, the blockade is largely ineffective. By trying to enforce the continental system among uncooperative elements of Spain, now ruled by Napoleon's brother Joseph, and Portugal, Napoleon will end up having to endure the constant harassment of the disastrous guerrilla fighting of the Peninsular War. The continental system also fails to reduce British and Rothschild financial support to its allies. The Polish legions of the coalition wars are Polish military units that served with the French army from 1797 to 1803, with some units continuing to fight until 1815. Because France's enemies include Poland's conquerors, Prussia, Austria, and Imperial Russia, the Poles see Napoleon as their champion. When Napoleon enters Warsaw in 1806, it set the stage for the establishment of the independent Grand Duchy of Warsaw. Many Polish soldiers, officers, and volunteers emigrate to Italy and to France, where they join forces with the local military. Polish recruits number many thousands. With support from Napoleon, Polish units are formed, bearing Polish military ranks and commanded by Polish officers. They become known as the Polish Legions, a Polish army under French organization. The Polish legions fight a victorious war against Austria in 1809 and go on to fight alongside the French in numerous campaigns, culminating in the invasion of Russia in 1812. After enduring huge losses in battles with Napoleon's armies, Russia is ready for peace. 
Napoleon's forces, though victorious, are also weary from fighting and unable to pursue the Russian armies further. Finally, Tsar Alexander I makes peace with Napoleon with the Treaty of Tilsit in 1807. The Russian ruler accepts France's continental position and vows support of Napoleon. For his part, Napoleon believes Alexander has extended him a hand of friendship. The 1800s Napoleon is very tolerant in his attitude towards the Jews. As a result, he has won the respect of many of them, but he has his motives. Historian Rabbi Burrell Wine reveals that Napoleon was primarily interested in seeing the Jews assimilated rather than prosper as an alien community. Quote, Napoleon's outward tolerance and fairness toward Jews was actually based upon his grand plan to have them disappear entirely by means of total assimilation, intermarriage, and conversion. End quote. This attitude can be seen from a letter Napoleon wrote in November 1806. Quote, it is necessary to reduce, if not destroy, the tendency of Jewish people to practice a very great number of activities that are harmful to civilization and to public order in society in all the countries of the world. It is necessary to stop the harm by preventing it. To prevent it, it is necessary to change the Jews. Once part of their youth will take its place in our armies, they will cease to have Jewish interests and sentiments. Their interests and sentiments will be French." End quote. Again, privately, in an 1808 letter to his brother Jerome, Napoleon makes his assimilation plans clear. Quote, I have undertaken to reform the Jews, but I have not endeavored to draw more of them into my realm. Far from that, I have avoided doing anything which could show any esteem for the most despicable of mankind. End quote. 1808 in response to complaints about Jewish moneylenders, Napoleon had, in 1806, suspended all debts owed to them. In 1808, he goes a step further and issues a decree that the moneylenders refer to as the infamous decree. Napoleon wants the Jews to move away from their traditional moneylending practices and become farmers and craftsmen instead. His decree... His decree severely restricts the practice of lending and annuls all debts owed by married women, miners, and soldiers. Any loan that had an interest rate exceeding 10% is also annulled. Napoleon's religious tolerance is admired by many of the Jews, but his efforts to regulate usury upset the Jewish moneylenders and seals his fate. That is why, to this day, they refer to Napoleon's decree as the infamous decree. Led by Nathan in Britain, the five Rothschild brothers of Europe, based in Britain, Germany, Italy, Austria, and France, are determined to destroy Napoleon before his anti-debt monetary philosophy can take hold in Europe. 1808-1814 British international intrigue draws Spain into war against its former French ally. The years of fighting in Spain takes a heavy burden on France's grand army. While the French win battle after battle, their communications and supply lines are severely tested. French units are isolated, harassed, and slowly bled to death by guerrilla fighters. The Spanish armies are repeatedly beaten, but time and again they regroup and hound the French. This drain on French resources leads Napoleon to call the conflict the Spanish Ulcer. 1809 Once again, the Austrians and British, these people simply will not quit, join forces to try to overthrow Napoleon, and once again Napoleon thumps the Austrians, this time at the Battle of Wagram, July 1809. But the British remain active in Spain, slowly wearing down the French. 1811. Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I of Russia had been enjoying friendly personal relations. By 1811, however, tensions increase as Alexander comes under intense pressure from political forces within the Russian nobility to break off the alliance with France and enter into Coalition 6, heavily funded by Nathan Rothschild. Fearing another two-front war, Napoleon threatens serious consequences if Russia forms an alliance with Britain. In 1812, advisors, intriguers, to Alexander suggests an invasion of the French Empire and recapture of Poland, now an ally of France. On receipt of intelligence reports on Russia's war preparations, Napoleon prepares for a preemptive offensive campaign against Russia. The invasion begins on June 23, 1812. In support of its never-ending wars against Napoleon, 
The British Navy forces unwilling individuals into service. Residents of seaports live in fear of the impressment gangs that patrol waterfronts and raid taverns, pouncing on deserters and idle mariners. Prints from the time show armed gangs kidnapping men in their beds or barging into weddings and hauling the groom out, much to the distress of the bride. But generally, pressing takes place at sea, where the armed gangs board merchant ships. These ships are ransacked of their men and often left without sufficient hands to take them safely into port. American ships are stopped and searched in British waters. Anyone born in Britain is seized. Sometimes American citizens are taken by mistake. Between 1793 and 1812, the British impress more than 15,000 sailors to supplement their fleet. By June 1812, the U.S. has had enough. The United States declares war on Great Britain, citing in part the British practice of impressment. September 7, 1812. The fighting at the Battle of Borodino in Russia involves 250,000 troops and results in about 80,000 casualties, making Borodino the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon's Grand Army launches an attack against the Russian army, driving it back from its positions but failing to score a decisive victory. Both armies are exhausted after the battle, and the Russians withdrew from the field the following day. Moscow will fall a week later, but because the Russian army was not badly beaten enough to be rendered ineffective, the French are unable to bring Tsar Alexander back to the peace table. After their loss at Borodino, the Russians avoid Napoleon's objective of a decisive engagement and instead retreat deeper into Russia. Owing to the Russian army's scorched earth tactics, the French find it hard to forage food for themselves and their horses. Napoleon's own account: quote, "The most terrible of all my battles was the one before Moscow, Borodino. The French showed themselves to be worthy of victory, but the Russians showed themselves worthy of being invincible." End quote. Napoleon retreats from Moscow with most of his grand army intact. On the long march home, typhus wipes out most of his men. One by one, Napoleon's allies will become former allies and members of the Sixth Coalition. 1812 to 1814. From his base in London's financial district, known as the City, Nathan Rothschild single-handedly continues to finance Britain's war to defeat Napoleon. Shipments of gold to the European continent fund the Duke of Wellington's armies and also those of Britain's allies, Prussia and Austria. The Rothschild brothers coordinate their activities across the continent and develop a network of agents, shippers, and couriers to transport gold across war-torn Europe. Were it not for Rothschild's limitless fortune, the Allies would surely have had to make peace with Napoleon by now. There is a lull in fighting over the winter of 1812 to 1813, as both the Russians and the French rebuild their forces. Napoleon is then able to field 350,000 troops. Emboldened by France's failure in Russia, Prussia joins with Austria, Sweden, Russia, Great Britain, Spain, and Portugal in a new coalition. Napoleon assumes command in Germany and inflicts a series of defeats on the coalition, culminating in the Battle of Dresden in August 1813. Despite these stunning successes against multiple armies, the losses continue to mount against Napoleon. The French army is eventually pinned down by a force twice its size at the Battle of Leipzig. This is by far the largest battle of the Napoleonic Wars and cost 90,000 casualties in total. March 1814. The four powers that defeated Napoleon—Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia—all agree to ally for 20 years, promising to fight together to stop France if it ever got too powerful again. The Treaty of Chaumont is a series of separately signed but identically worded agreements between the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, the Russian Empire, and the United Kingdom. The treaty will draw the powers of the Sixth Coalition into a closer alliance in the event that Napoleon rejects the territory-losing surrender terms recently offered to France. Each ally agrees to put 150,000 soldiers in the field against France and to guarantee the European peace, once obtained, against French aggression for 20 years. The terms of the treaty were largely written by Lord Castlereagh, the British Foreign Minister, who offered cash subsidies, Rothschild money, to keep the other armies in the field against Napoleon. April 1814. Napoleon withdraws back to France, his army having been reduced to 70,000 soldiers and 40,000 stragglers, against more than three times as many Allied troops. 
The French are surrounded as British forces press from the south and other coalition forces positioned to attack from the German states. Paris is captured by the coalition in March 1814. On April 2, 1814, the French Senate declares Napoleon deposed. When Napoleon learns that Paris has surrendered, he proposes that the army march on the capital. That is when some of his marshals mutiny. They confront Napoleon and force him to announce his unconditional abdication only two days later. The combination of Rothschild's endless money, cunning British intrigue, limitless allied manpower, the Spanish ulcer, and the disastrous typhus-infested retreat from Russia are all just too much for the French to overcome. After Napoleon's abdication, King Louis XVIII is installed as ruler of France. Napoleon is exiled to the island of Elba off the Italian coast, where he is given authority over the island's 12,000 inhabitants. February 1815 Separated from his wife and sons, and aware of rumors that he might be shipped to a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic, Napoleon stuns Europe by escaping from Elba with less than 1,000 supporters and soldiers in February of 1815. Soon after landing on the French mainland, a regiment of French soldiers, under orders to arrest him, confronts their former emperor. Napoleon approaches the regiment alone, dismounts his horse, and shouts, Here I am! Kill your emperor if you wish. The soldiers respond with, Long live the emperor, and march with Napoleon to Paris. King Louis XVIII flees. Napoleon quickly raises another army. He will once again confront the Rothschild-funded British and Prussians at the decisive Battle of Waterloo in Belgium. The powers at the Congress of Vienna declare Napoleon an outlaw. On March 25, 1815, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and the United Kingdom bind themselves to put 150,000 men each into the field to end his rule. This sets the stage for the last conflict on the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Waterloo. Again financed by the House of Rothschild, the British, led by the Duke of Wellington, and the Prussians, led by Gebhard von Blücher, amass their 7th coalition armies near the, near the northeastern border of France. Napoleon is forced to preemptively attack France's enemies before they can unleash a massive coordinated invasion of France, along with other members of this latest Allied coalition. The Battle of Waterloo is fought on Sunday, June 18, 1815, in present-day Belgium. The French army nearly wins the great battle. It is only the late arrival of Prussian reinforcements that suddenly tilts the battle against the French. The defeat at Waterloo marks the end of Napoleon's hundred days return from exile and ends his rule as emperor once and for all. The French monarchy is restored to the Bourbons for the second time. The very word Waterloo has since become synonymous with one's final defeat. In terms of blood and death, the British, Bourbon, Royalist, Rothschild obsession with removing Napoleon proved to be very costly. It would be 100 years before the world was to see mass war death on such a scale again. Military deaths are estimated to be somewhere between 2.5 million and 3.5 million. Civilian death tolls related to the war vary from 1 million to 3 million. Thus, estimates of total dead, both military and civilian, can reasonably range from 3.5 million to 6.5 million. To put those numbers into perspective, the death toll was 5 to 10 times greater than that of the deadly American Civil War of the 1860s. France and Allies 371,000 killed in action 800,000 killed by wounds, accidents, or disease, primarily in the disastrous invasion of Russia 600,000 civilians, 65,000 French allies, mainly Poles fighting for independence from Russia, Prussia, 1.8 million French and allies, mostly Germans and Poles, dead in action, disease, and missing, 1.7 million Frenchmen from pre-1792 borders, Britain and allies, 120,000 Italian dead or missing, 289,000 Russian dead or missing, 134,000 Prussian dead or missing, 376,000 Austrian dead or missing, 585,000 Spanish dead, 200,000 Portuguese dead or missing, 311,806 British dead or missing. Total, 2,015,000. British Navy, 1804 to 1815, killed in action, 6,663, Shipwrecks, drownings, and fire, 13,621. 
Wounds and Disease, 72,102. Total, 92,386. British Army, 1804 to 1815. Killed in Action, 25,569. Wounds, Accidents, and Disease, 193,851. The Rothschild brothers utilized courier pigeons to rapidly communicate amongst themselves and their agents. The network provides Nathan Rothschild with political and financial information ahead of his peers, giving him an advantage in the financial markets. After the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo, Rothschild receives word of the battle's outcome long before anyone else. Rothschild will use the insider information of Wellington's victory to become Britain's supreme master. He orders his brokers to sell off his holdings. Other brokers assume that Rothschild has therefore learned that Britain has lost at Waterloo. A panic sell-off drives the market down to historic lows. Rothschild then buys up the devalued market at bargain prices. When the public learns of Britain's victory over Napoleon, the stocks skyrocket to new heights. Nathan Rothschild multiplies his massive fortune by 20 times. 1814 to 1815 After Napoleon's defeat, the European powers continue their meetings in Vienna, Austria. Political boundaries are redrawn. Old disputes are settled. These conferences are known as the Congress of Vienna. Though many nations participate, the Congress is run by the Big Four, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. The most notable decision reached at Vienna is the consolidation of 360 small German states into a German confederation of 38 states. Arrangements made by the four great powers ensure that future disputes will be settled in a manner that will avoid the wars of the previous 20 years. Although the Congress of Vienna preserves the balance of power in Europe, it does not check the spread of the red revolutionary movements that are being born and will spread across Europe some 30 years later. Balance of power politics serves the interests of the globalist planners because it allows for a disobedient nation or nations to be checked, challenged, and controlled by a group of other nations of equal power. The Rothschilds and their agents will soon wield enormous financial influence in three of the big four nations. Only Russia still remains free of Rothschild's reach. 1815 After the final defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon is exiled to the island of St. Helena, 1,000 miles off the coast of West Africa. King Louis XVIII is installed on the throne and, predictably, allows Napoleon's infamous decree against usury to expire in 1818. The Rothschilds are back in control. Rumors of Napoleon returning will continue to occasionally circulate throughout Europe. Napoleon is neglected by his British captors and will finally die in 1821, at age 51, from what appears to be arsenic poisoning. 1815-1848 in the political vacuum left by Napoleon's removal, Rothschild's communist subversive groups as well as semi-controlled nationalist groups grow and spread throughout the European continent. This movement spontaneously erupts during the bloody and chaotic European Spring of 1848. In that same year, Karl Marx publishes the Communist Manifesto. Marx himself is distantly related to the Rothschilds through marriage. By destroying Napoleon and buying up Great Britain at the same time, the Rothschild family was able to unleash its New World Order gang to subvert Europe. The spontaneous nationalist and red revolutions of 1848 will permanently weaken Europe's political structures, setting the stage for the disastrous wars and revolutions of the coming centuries. 1918. Fast forward 100 years. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the Rothschild-Britain complex skillfully maneuvered the Russian, Prussian, German, and Austrian empires to keep fighting against Napoleon. To that end, Nathan Rothschild stood by with limitless financing. How ironic, how short-sighted, how poetically tragic that a century later it was the very same Rothschild-Britain complex, now with American assistance, that delivered the post-World War I death blow to each of those empires. For the full story on this centuries-old saga, read the two-volume illustrated epic, Planet Rothschild, also by M.S. King. A Final Thought Had Napoleon succeeded in ruling France and influencing European affairs, Rothschild's New World Order communism would have been killed in its infancy. So, too, would the plague of Jewish moneylending, which still enslaves Europe and America. 
Again, we say what tragic irony that the British, Prussians, Austrians, and Russians who allied against Napoleon would one day all see their own nations externally conquered or internally subverted by the very same Rothschild New World Order Reds who financed the endless wars against Napoleon. Napoleon had the stuff of legend running through his veins. It would be more than 100 years before Europe and the world would again see another giant like him. His name? Adolf Hitler. Suggested reading The Bad War, also by M.S. King.